Okay, right. Well, so we're now going to look at um, global analysis, structural global analysis, which is covered in both Eurocode 3 and Eurocode 4 in Clause 5. Eurocode 3 obviously giving most of the rules that we need for global analysis for general steelworks, and Eurocode 4 just making a few supplementary um, remarks for composite sections. So what we're going to look at, we're really going to follow the numbering system in Clause 5 of Eurocode 3. So we'll first of all look at just uh, some general requirements for structural modelling. Then we'll look at requirements for global analysis. We'll pick up imperfections again, um, very similar treatment of imperfections to that which was in Eurocode 2, discussed the other day. Um, we'll look at uh, what's called methods of analysis considering material nonlinearities. That sounds like it's going to be all about nonlinear analysis, but it in fact isn't. It's actually just treating really the effects of cracking, um, which is a sort of nonlinear problem in a linear elastic way. And that, that's really just basically telling us to do things the same way we used to do in the BS5400. And then we'll just finish up with looking at the classification of cross sections, which is if you're used to de designing two bridges to BS5400, um, a slightly different approach in the Eurocodes, but if you're a building designer, then you'll find it's exactly the same as you've been doing to BS5950 uh, for some time. So right at the start of Section 5, there's a principle. Uh, it's a similar principle to the one which was in Eurocode 2, and it's really just telling you that however you do your analysis, it needs to be, sort of quotes, realistic. So we need to model um, the real behaviour as best as we can. And it basically then goes on to say what it means. It means that we need, once again, to consider shear lag, where that um, has any, any major impact on the analysis. We have to consider the effects of local plate buckling as well. This is, this is new. We haven't bothered to do that previously in the PS500. We need to consider uh, the effects of joint stiffness, if that's relevant. We need to consider soil structure interaction. And if we've got cables, well, we need to model the cables in a realistic way as well. So that, those provisions are all in Eurocode 3. Um, the only thing that Eurocode 4 really adds, again, as a principle, is that we must model concrete cracking in our analysis. What we're going to do now is really just look through each of those first five bullets in a little bit more detail. So, firstly, with shear lag, uh, just, a, just a, a quick explanation of what, what shear lag is using this diagram. Um, shear lag is an effect whereby in wide flanges, the, the in-plane shear flexibility of the flange leads to a non-uniform distribution of stress across that flange. Um, the best way I've found to illustrate this is really with this sort of simple diagram. So at the, at the top of the diagram there, we have a simply supported box girder with a knife edge load in the middle of it. And if we look down on the, on the top flange and isolate a little transverse strip, and we look at the shear stress distribution across that strip, we get the picture at the bottom, and that shear stress distribution will shear the little strip into a curved shape. So if we put all of those little strips back together again, then what we get at the free ends of the beam in the middle here is a curved shape again. We get a curved free end from the effects of shear lag. Now this top flange is in compression, so you can see that on the outsides of the plate, the plate is actually slightly shorter than it is on the middle of the plate which means the compressive membrane stress must be greater towards the edges of the plate over the tops of the webs. So that gives us this non-uniform distribution of axial stress, but it also leads to an increase in flexibility of the cross-section because, because the, the stresses over the tops of the webs are bigger than you predict from just using a gross section property. The strains are also bigger over the tops of the webs. If the strains top and bottom are bigger, then the curvatures are bigger, and therefore the deflections are bigger. So. That's really the background to, um, to shear lag. It's obviously quite easy to talk through the problem like that, but it's incredibly difficult to actually do a calculation to realistically determine that effect because real geometries are not simply supported. They're not a single knife edge load. Um, steel uh, yields, so we have different sort of widths at serviceability and the ultimate limit state. And if you've got Reinforced concrete as a slab, it doesn't even behave the same in the two directions because you've got different amounts of reinforcement in the two directions. You've got cracking, uh, you've got yielding the reinforcement. So the codes have to take a fairly simplified approach to um, calculations of shear lag. And in the same way as for concrete, we used effective widths just to model the, uh, the, 
the flexibility. We do exactly the same in, in steel design. The rules are different depending whether you're looking at a concrete slab on a steel bridge or whether you're looking at a pure steel flange. Um, composite is what we do mostly day to day rather than sort of pure steel boxes. And for composite design, the rules are very, very similar to what they were in Eurocode 2 for concrete slabs, but not identical. The approach is the same, but the actual numbers are not quite the same. So if we, if we have a, a multi-beam deck such as the one here, then what we basically have as an effective width is the distance between the outer shear studs. That's, that's a given. That's our starting point. And then we need to determine the effective outstand um, between the beams. And the outstand is taken as the lesser of the full available width, i.e. half the distance to the adjacent beam, or uh, LE over 8. And again, like Eurocode 2, LE is the distance between points of zero bending moment uh, in the span. So if we're doing a design at mid-span, for example, in a continuous beam, then this diagram tells us that the value of LE is just simply 70% of the span. And if we're looking at an internal support, for example, to work out the shear lag there, then the diagram is telling us that the distance between points of zero bending moment is 25% of the sum of the adjacent two spans. And you won't remember, but for, for, for Eurocode 2, that number was 15% of the spans. So that's, um, that's uh, shear lag. There are, there are separate rules for um, shear lag in, in orthotropic or bare steel boxes. Um, I won't go through that now because it's a little bit more complicated a calculation, but the same principle applies. You, fundamentally, your calculation is based on the distance between the points of zero bending moment in the same way. And there's a similar diagram. Um, I mentioned we have to take account of, of plate buckling in our section properties. This, this kicks in when we have um, what's known as a class 4 section, which we'll talk about in one of the, the, the later sections. But class 4 sections are essentially where we can't reach yield in a component before we get local buckling. So our limiting stress, if you like, in that component is somewhere less than yield. And local buckling leads to loss of strength, obviously. That's why we're not getting up to yield, because we've got bending from buckling going on. But it also leads to a loss of stiffness as well. And the reason it, le it uh, leads to a lot of stiffness is really sort of summed up in the diagram that's up on the, the screen there, which is as soon as we get um, somewhere near the elastic critical load of a plate, then we'll start to develop buckling waveforms. And we'll start developing out of plane effects like this right from very, very small loads because all plate panels will always come ready-made with imperfections in them anyway and out of plane displacements. But as we, as we get nearer and nearer to the elastic critical load, those bows will grow. And if we look if we look at the, this particular plate example, then um, if we look at the outside of the plates, that's got to be held straight because it's attached to the boundaries. Um, the peaks or buckling displacements are in the middle of the plate. This plate's in compression. If you look at the developed length along the middle, because we've got this sine wave, the developed length of the plate is longer than it is on the outside. If it's longer, and the plate is in compression, then there must be less compression. So there's less membrane stress in the middle of the plate than there is on the outside of the plate, uh, which leads to this, again, a nonlinear distribution of, of, of stress across the plate. So that leads to basically a, a higher stress at the outside of the plate than you'd imagine just from if you use gross section properties. But basically that loss of stiffness in the middle of the plate does lead to some loss of stiffness in the, in the overall section. And so the, the the code Eurocode 315 tells you that you need to consider the effects of plate buckling in your stiffness, but it gives you a, a caveat, which is that as long as the loss of ultimate limit strength is not more than 50%, then you can neglect the effects of this problem. If, you're, if your loss of um, section or loss of strength of individual plate components is, is more than 50%, then you've got to include that loss of section property basically in your global analysis and um, we'll, we'll, when we come on to talk about class 4 sections we'll, we'll talk about how you derive the section properties uh, to take that into account. Generally speaking this, this, this dispensation of sort of 50% means that in global analysis you won't need to do it because if, you, if, you, if your ultimate limit state design is such that you're losing more than sort of 50% of your component for buckling then you probably aren't using the material very efficiently and you might want to change the design use a thicker plate or put another stiffener on or something. Uh, 
Um, joint modeling. There's a couple of uh, clauses relating to joint modeling. Basically, ge generally, you can ignore the presence of joints. So if you've got uh, a, a sort of typical splice and a steel composite bridge, the way we normally make them, with sort of two cover plates, we don't need to consider the flexibility of that joint. You'd be pleased to know. We just, we just analyze it as a continuous structure in the same way. Um, the one exception where we do have to consider the stiffness of joints is, is where we have something called semi-continuous joints. The Eurocode splits joint types up into three. We have rigid joints, which are, as they sound, uh, rigid and they can transmit um, bending moment and they're designed for that. We have uh, pinned joints, which again, as they sound, you know, they're not designed to transmit any, any moment. They're designed to, to rotate. And then we have something in between, semi-continuous joints, which can transmit some moment, but they're actually relatively flexible. And probably the, the simplest and best example of a semi-continuous joint would be two beams joined together through end plates that aren't stiffened. So if you, if you join, join the beam together through end plates and bolt them, when you put some moment, the plates will, will flex, the joint will tend to open a bit, the bolts will tend to sort of lengthen a bit in tension, and that's a flexible connection. And if you had one of those, you'd have to model that flexibility in your analysis. For bridges, um, you kind of don't get into that problem normally because we're not supposed to use semi-continuous joints in bridges because they are difficult to predict the fatigue life of. And the only real exception to that, I think, is probably in U-frame construction. Um, generally, even in U-frames, we have transverse beams framing into vertical stiffness and uh, sort of made through lap connections or, or, um, or sort of double cover plate connections, and then they're rigid. But if you were to have a situation where you joined your transverse girder through an end plate directly into the web, then you would create a, a flexible joint. So this is actually not really saying anything different to what BS500 Part 3 said. Because if you were designing a U-frame, when you come to work out the stiffness of that U-frame, you looked at the stiffness of the transverse girders, you looked at the stiffness of the vertical stiffness, but you also had to include a term for the joint flexibility as well. And they were different depending whether basically you had something which was semi-continuous or something which was sort of rigidly welded and stiffened. For... Uh, Ground structure interaction, there's a clause, um, and it's not at all helpful. So it, in, in the UK, we obviously do a lot of integral bridges, and I think we do far more integral bridges than most of our mainland European counterparts. So when we see sort of structure interaction, ground structure interaction, we're thinking about lots of nice rules to design integral bridges, and you won't find any such rules, basically, in, in Eurocode 3 or 4. In fact, there are, there's very little of any great help even in Eurocode 7 on integral bridges. There's a, there's a PD being produced by BSI, um, which basically tells you how to design integral bridges using Eurocode 7. And it's probably the only useful PD, I think, coming out, because it does actually contain information that isn't actually present anywhere else. BA42 is still in use. BA42 is still in use at the moment, but it will become superseded by this PD. And, and you'll find there's a lot of similarity between PD and BA42 um, in terms of these sort of K-star type pressures, but the, 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 the derivation of those is slightly different in the PD, and also the pressure diagram down the height of the pile is different. It's, it's become a, a little less odorous. <laughs> we don't have the same peak pressures all the way down. They, they dissipate off. So really, 5.1.3 on ground structure interaction tells you very little, um, and really it, it doesn't say much more than if the foundations are flexible, then you need to model the flexibility of the foundations in your analysis. So it's not, not a terribly useful. Um, again, we don't generally do cable supported structures day to day, but it's just worth pointing out that um, whilst BS500 did not give you any rules on how to analyze a cable stay bridge or other cable supported structures, there is a part of the Eurocodes, Eurocode 1993 part 1 1.11, which is explicitly or specifically for analyzing cable supported structures. So it, it, it gives you rules on global analysis, but it also gives you rules about the sort of typical cable properties and behavior. So if you want to work out, for example, the stiffness of a cable to take account of its catenary sag, which, which reduces its stiffness, then there are rules in there for how you include the cable sag in, in stiffness. And there's also rules for um, how you combine dead loads and the cable forces. Um, the, the, the diagram here is, is, is showing um, what happens if you basically factor 
cable forces and dead loads separately. Um, on, the, on the left, the pictures are showing the, the nominal forces, so that the, the force P is just basically the cable installation force, and W is the, is the dead load. The question always came in the past, if you're doing a cable state bridge, is when, when you get to the ultimate limit state, how do you factor those loads? Um, now if you have quite a long span on the flexible deck, and you choose to sort of factor um, down, say, uh, the, the cable forces, um, and you factor up the dead loads, then what you end up with is just absolutely ridiculous deflections. So on, on, on a real bridge, you know, with a couple of hundred meter span or something, if you do that, you might end up with sort of 10 meters of deflection, which clearly you wouldn't get on site because you know, even the worst contractor would spot that he was building it sort of 10 meters out of place. Um, if you have a very short, stiff deck, then you might not have that safeguard. You, know, you, you could actually have the forces, the cable forces much lower than you wanted and the dead load a bit more and the deflections might not be very much and you might not notice it. Uh, so there's always been a bit of arguments about where you put the factors and the Eurico 3111 basically clears that up, makes everyone use the same rules and what it, what it says is you basically derive an entity, a set of deflections or bending moments from P and W as, as nominal loads and then you factor that whole entity up or down but you don't factor the individual components up and down separately. There's also, um, at the bottom bullet there, there's, it also explains what, what it is that you do in the situation if you remove a cable suddenly through an accident. There's a dynamic effect and it explains basically how you take that into account. You, but you basically look at this, the forces in the bridges and the, and the adjacent cables before and after the cable's been removed just statically. And then you, you multiply the difference between those two stress states or, or, or moment states by a factor K to allow for the dynamic impact. Okay, so in terms of global analysis, um, before I say anything to this slide, the same applies um, to steel as it did to concrete. So you won't really see any great difference in the way you analyze structures. So if you were doing a, a sort of multi-beam steel composite deck or a ladder deck and you used a grillage analysis before, then that's what you'd be doing going forward. If you've, if you've moved on and decided that you like doing these things using shell models, well, you do the same going forward. Um, it does look different though in Eurico 3 because once again the default method of analysis is second order and you have to sort of prove that a first order analysis is okay. But those sort of examples I've just quoted because you haven't got any compression in the deck or any significant compression in the deck then clearly a first order analysis will be satisfactory. Um, the specific criteria of how you actually, if you actually want to take a given structure and you you haven't got any experience of this particular type of structure and you don't you have the faintest idea whether second order effects are important or not then the criteria it gives you um, is the one here alpha crit equals f crit over fed and all that is saying is that uh, I need to basically do a, an eigenvalue analysis on the structure with the loads on there and as long as my load factor against elastic buckling is more than 10 then second order effects are not critical not important they're very small and we can just do a, a first order analysis. The pro problem with that is that basically to avoid doing a second order analysis you still need to do an eigenvalue analysis which probably means you need to have a computer program with the capability of doing a second order analysis anyway because they, they normally come as a pair eigenvalue and nonlinear. Uh, so experience is a great thing to avoid having to do this clearly. Um, there's a, a simpler sort of statement of that which we can make, which is which is given in, in Eurocode 4 part 2 in the composite code, um, where instead of saying that we need to make sure that the load factor against elastic buckling is greater than 10, it basically says that M1 divided by delta M1 must be greater than 10. And all that is, is saying is, is if I've got a, a structure and I analyze it first order and I get a set of moments M1, if I look at the deflections I got, from that analysis and then at each cross section I multiply the deflection by the axial force in that element to get a delta M1 then I can use those two pieces of information that I've derived from a first order analysis to again have a criteria to see whether or not I need to do a, a second order analysis. Um, so you could you could also use that as a simpler um, case. That um, equivalence if you like between that simple method and the full eigenvalue method only works for a pin-ended 
struts. That's how it's been derived. But it's safe for all other situations. It, it's generally conservative. And the, the diagram here is trying to explain why it's um, conservative. If we just take a, a simple you know, vertical column on castre at both ends, and the only, um, the, the only bending moment we get in that when we analyze it is due to an initial imperfection, say, then when we analyze that, we'll get a, we'll get a bending moment like the diagram on the end with, some, with a fixed end uh, uh, bending moment. The deflections we'll get are the middle picture. And if we then apply, if we then try and calculate delta M1 from that, we'd have to basically say that was P times delta. But in actual fact, the second order moments that we get from, from that is less than P delta, as we see on the, the, the third diagram over on the right, because the extra bending moments also have a fixed ended component, which, which drags the whole bending moment diagram across. So you see in that particular situation that the simple um, the simple test here of M1 divided by delta M1 greater than 10 is conservative, and I say that's the general situation. It will usually be conservative. Um, if you do have to do a, or if your computer, if your calculation is telling you that you do have to do a second order analysis, then there are basically three ways of, of doing it, or three ways of considering um, second order effects. What we will mostly do is what we always used to do, which is item three. So we can still, even if we've got susceptibility to second order effects, i.e. buckling, we can still choose to um, do a first order effect, a first order analysis, and then just do member buckling checks on all of the slender components. So that might apply to the slender column, or it might apply to lateral torsional buckling, for example, of a, of a deck. We, we might apply that alpha crit test to a sort of shell model of a bridge and find that well, our load factor is less than 10 because of lateral torsional buckling. Well, that doesn't mean we have to now do a second order analysis. We can still do a first order analysis and treat buckling through effective lengths um, or you know, whatever means of, of, of doing member buckling resistance checks. So item three is the way we'll carry on doing things, I'm sure. Um, but you can use the computer if you want to. Um, so we could do a second order analysis, and if, if we're going to do a computer second order analysis, then we need to allow in that analysis for both local and global imperfections, because these are, these are basically contained within the buckling curves that we use. That's where the resistance has come from, by an assumption that there are local and global imperfections. Um, the code means by a global imperfection, it means the sort of situation on the right where the whole structure is leaning over, it's swayed over. Uh, by local imperfections, it means that the that there's, there is some sort of out of uh, yeah off axis displacement between the between the nodes of the, the ends of the member, but the structure itself stays in place and doesn't sway across. So we can do a second order analysis considering both those types of imperfections, um, or there's a second alternative, bullet point two, which I, I really honestly cannot see why anybody would ever choose to do which is it allows you to do a second order analysis allowing only for the global imperfections. So we could model this structure on the right lent over and ignore the imperfections within the columns themselves. But if we do that, we then have to do a member buckling check, a codified check of the, of the columns using an effective length equal to the length of the column. So you've got the worst of both worlds in that situation. You have to do a second order analysis and then you're still doing member buckling checks. If we just went straight to member buckling checks and first order analysis, in this particular case, our effective length would be longer than the column length because it is a sort of sway component. So if we want to do the second order analysis, we can either use a computer or there's a, there's a hand calculation method as well given in the, um, the URI codes. And I'll just say just a few words about that because this, this sort of formula, if you like, keeps cropping up throughout Eurocode 3, we'll see it sort of other times today and probably also tomorrow and things like transverse stiffener design. If you need to do second order analysis, so you, you can use basically what this, this formula um, here, uh, which is in Eurocode 3 part 2 expression 5.2. And what that's saying is if I do a first order analysis, then I can obtain um, from the first order bending moments in the system, I can obtain the second order moments 
um, by taking the first order moment and multiplying by this factor here, which contains alpha grit, again, the load factor against elastic buckling. You might have to get alpha grit from a computer model as well, or alternatively, it may, it, there may be other means of getting it. Um, like if you, if you know it's just a, a column or a series of columns which are creating the problem, then we know, for example, that the F grit for the column will be pi squared EI over effective length squared. So we could use that, for example, to, to, to work out what alpha grit might be. But you'll see that expression of how to get second order moments from first order moments as, by an amplifying factor. You'll see as a, a recurring theme in the cases in lots and lots of clauses. And it's all really derived, again, just from a pin-ended strut, where it's a kind of an, ex an exact uh, equivalence. And for other situations, it's conservative. And so, I mean, for a, for a pin-ended strut, um, you can see that the, the, the expression above is basically how the second-order moments have been derived. Uh, if we've got an initial imperfection, then we have an initial moment of F times FED times A naught. And we'd use basic Euler theory to say that, that gets amplified by a factor of one minus one over one minus F over F crit, uh, which leads to the expression at the end here: the second order moment would be equal to the first order moment times this amplification factor. And that's just been literally translated into the whole the whole structure approach in the second equation. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide, but there's a lot more detail in the book on this and also on the Bridges site, but it's just trying to explain why that approach of amplifying the first order moments to second order moments is, again, generally conservative. Um, and you can always use it. We may want effective lengths for various reasons still in the Eurocode. So we might want an effective length because we're trying to determine critical buckling force to use in that sort of expression. Or we might just want an effective length to help us define a slenderness later on to do a member buckling check. Um, and there are various places in the Eurocodes that give you expressions for effective length. Uh, and this table here is actually not in Eurocode 3, it's in Eurocode 2 in the concrete code, but there's no reason why you can't use these values. You've got a whole series of uh, different end conditions, um, rigid end conditions, conditions with spring ends, uh, ends held in position, or ends that can, can displace relative to each other. And providing you have um, some idea of the, of the end stiffnesses, you can, you can derive any effective length yeah, between fully rigid conditions and pinned conditions. We'll say more about effective lengths when we come on to, to, to talk about um, buckling of struts, um, because you'll see that whilst we've used it effective length extensively to define slendernesses in BS5400, you can do that in the Eurico, but it's not the first definition of slenderness. In fact, I'd actually forgotten we've got this slide coming up. This, this, this is actually what the first definitions of slenderness are in the Eurocodes. So for buckling of a strutting compression, oops, sorry, buckling of a strutting compression, um, the slenderness is actually root of the squash load divided by n crit, the elastic critical buckling force. Uh, but if you write n crit as pi squared ei over l effective squared and substitute that into that equation, you will get a slenderness, which is basically l over um, radius of gyration times some function of e and the function of the yield stress, and it will look much more like it did in BS500. But most of the definitions of slenderness, and the, the same is true of, um, of, of buckling of a beam in bending, slenderness there is the cross-section yield moment divided by the elastic critical buckling moment. They've been written like this to basically facilitate design from computer packages. I think in many ways the UK is behind a lot of our mainland European counterparts that have been using computers much more frequently to sort of derive slendernesses. Um, and we're kind of playing catch up a little bit here. I'll just say something quickly about um, elastic critical buckling because I, th I think um, we will be using it more frequently going forward. Um, the arch example is probably not a very mainstream example, um, but it's very useful for designing arches. But we will be using it more, I'm sure, for checking things like beams, paired beams during construction, um, because it's actually in many ways quicker to use the computer to do the check than it is to follow through the laborious process that we have for beams with torsional restraints in BS500 Part 3. And it's a lot more economic to do it with the, with the Eurocode. 
So, I mean, just, just this is a sort of taster, really. Uh, if you have an arch structure, the, the previous approach to checking the arch rib in BS 500s would have been to work out, first of all, the slenderness for the arch, and then go to the buckling curves and read off the reduction factor. So to get the slenderness, we would have to, first of all, work out the effective length. And that's not that simple, because you'd have to worry about in-plane buckling and outer-plane buckling, um, what effect do the hangers have, what effect do the transverse beams at the top have in, in helping reduce the effective length. So it's not a, not a simple question, but we would have made up some something, um, hopefully conservative. Having got the effective length, um, the slenderness is effective length divided by radius of gyration, and that cross-section is tapered. So which cross-section is the one I use for my radius of gyration? Is it, is it the minimum cross-section? Is it the maximum cross-section? Is it the cross-section in the middle third of the arch? Is it in the middle third of the wave of buckling of arch? Again, you know, we'd have to, we'd have to come up with something conservative, and then we'd have to use that. But there's a lot of... Um, thinking involved there and some of it possibly a little bit arbitrary. Yeah. With the computer, again if you have the capability with something like LUSAS, then to analyze this structure what we would just do is put the loading onto the structure, select eigenvalue analysis and we, we would get a whole series of mode shapes. Um, the lowest mode here being the one on the bottom left being both arches swaying over to the to the side, and the second lowest mode is the in-plane buckling, where the, the arch buckles down in one half and buckles up um, in the other half. So, to basically get a, a reduction factor on strength of this arch using the Eurocode, we would do two checks. First of all, we would just do first order analysis and work out the load factor alpha cross for cross-sectional failure, ignoring buckling. Then we'd look at the computer and see what the load factor against elastic buckling alpha crit was, and we would get a slenderness for the whole arch uh, from the root of those two load factors, alpha cross over alpha crit. And from that slenderness, we then go to a, a set of curves, which will be familiar because they're basically the same curves that we had in BS500. Um, for the given slenderness, we'd read off the cross-section reduction factor, and then we just apply that as a strength reduction factor to the whole arch when we do the design. So we haven't actually had to worry about thinking about effective lengths or radius of durations, and we've just gone straight um, to the reduction factor for the arch from the whole cross-section. Going back to more slightly more mundane things, <laughs> the, the other thing that the Eurocode tells us we need to um, think about in our analysis is, is slip of bolts. Um, and that's dealt with in, in, in clause 5.2.16. Basically, what we do here is the same that we've, again, that we've done in previous PS5 run practice, um, but it hasn't really been written down anywhere in the code. So, for example, if we're designing a splice, again, between sort of two main beams, standard splice, um, then we don't need to worry about slipper bolts in that sort of situation. Um, even if we've designed um, the splice to slip at the ultimate limit state, which is um, uh, category B is the is the definition Eurico 318 um, for that type of bolt that can that can slip at the ultimate limit state. Um, if we are considering bracing members, then we really should avoid any slip of that bracing member at all even at the ultimate limit state, which means designing it as a category C connection. That means no, no slip of the bolts at the ultimate limit state. If we get slip of the bolts, then our effective restraint to the compression flange or whatever we're bracing is, is very much reduced. And there'll be some deformation of the, of the component we're trying to brace. And that component, that, that deformation of the component will lead to additional stresses, additional P-delta effects, which haven't been included in the analysis. So for bracing members, design them not to slip if you can't do that and you have to have some slip at the ultimate limit state, then I'm afraid you have to then do, do the whole thing as a second order analysis and allow for that slip of the bolts in the connections. So basically don't let them slip, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, imperfections we've already sort of covered. I, th I think the most important thing to note is, is that imperfections in Eurocode 3 are made up of two components. 
Um, we have geometrical imperfections, which likely, like, like we're in Eurocode 2, basically just represent departures from the intended setting out dimensions on the drawings. Um, so that might be you know, macroscopic things like overall leans of columns, um, but it might also be plate panels of a, of a plate girder. They're not flat. You know, they, have, they have imperfections out of plane um, displacements to start with. So that, that's, that's one aspect of imperfections. The steel work, the other, the other aspect of imperfections is residual stresses. And for, for beams that are made up by welding or rolling, even if, they, even if they end up appearing to be flat at the end of the process, they will have some residual stresses in the section from the manufacturing process. And if you have residual stresses, then it means that when you put external loads on, you will reach yield at some point in the cross-section earlier than you thought you would. Um, and therefore, you will get some extra deformation earlier than you thought you would uh, if there were no residual stresses. So when you do analyses, second-order analyses, um, with local and global imperfections in the Eurocode, um, section 5.3.1 paragraph 2 gives you some equivalent geometrical imperfections that you use in your analysis. And they are basically representing the summation of those two different sources of imperfection. So if you, if you look at what's in the code, and it tells you, for example, this is, this is the bow in my column, and you then go to EN 1090 part 2, which is the, the workmanship standard, and you look at what the fabricator is allowed to build the thing to, you will find that the, the, the tolerance in EN 1090 part 2 is a much smaller bow than the design value that we have to do. And the, the main reason for that is not huge factors of safety, it's the fact that we're also including the residual stresses in that imperfection, not just the, the tolerance that the, the fabricator is working to. Um, that's a pretty horrible one. Um, I'll just mention it just in case you see it. I, I, again, um, there's, a, there's an alternative, basic, there's two alternatives. We, we can either, if we're doing second order analysis, um, so I'll just jump back to the previous picture, we can either look at the structure and take a view about what which sets of imperfections will give us the worst answer. So we might decide that I'll, I'll have it all leaning over in this direction, and then on top of that I'll put these local bows in. But that might not be the worst. It might be worse if it's like thinking over and the, the, the local bows are in opposite directions or something. Um, so we can, we can choose to do it this way and probably a bit of iteration to make sure that we get the right answer. Or alternatively, again, if we've already done an eigenvalue analysis and we've got a buckled mode shape, um, then we can use that mode shape as an initial imperfection. But the eigenvalue analysis will only give you a mode shape. It won't give you an amplitude. Um, anything to scale it by. So essentially this is all this expression is doing. Um, the eta init is basically the um, the peak displacement that you apply to that um, eigenvalue mode shape. So that wherever, wherever the biggest displacement on that mode shape we make that dimension equal to init and everything else is scaled down from there. And you'll see in there that you've got, in working out what the um, initial imperfection is, we've got lambda, which is the slenderness. Uh, what's happening here is it, it, the, the expression is kind of backwardly working the imperfections in buckling curves um, from the slenderness to, to work out what imperfection you need to apply to the model to give compatibility with the buckling curves. There's a, the derivation of that is in the Thomas Telford guide, if, it, if it's really that interest. <coughs> Um, if we want to do the, if we want to actually put the imperfections in ourselves by hands, um, we have the global imperfections and local imperfections. Global imperfections are very similar to Eurocode 2, so the basic lean imperfection is 1 in 200, but then we can factor that down to account for height. The taller it gets, the less likely we're going to get that full 1 in 200. And also we can factor it down again for number of elements. So if we have lots and lots and lots of columns, probabilit probabilistically it's very unlikely that they will all be leaning over in the same direction with the full magnitude. So if, we, if we're considering lots of columns all leaning over, then we can reduce the magnitude. And the local imperfections, well, it's not too much to say to that. The code basically gives you a table and the offset that we use, the imperfection in, in the member, is just a function of length. So the longer the member, the bigger the imperfection we have to consider. If you're doing FE modeling, um, we are not going to go through that now, but there's a very detailed treatment of imperfections in FE modeling in Eurocode 3 Part 2 in the Annex C. So if you have plate girders, 
it will tell you what, what imperfections to use in the analysis for um, the plate panels and for the stiffeners. Okay, um, considering material nonlinearities, basically the, the, the default method of analysis really is uh, linear elastic, again, in the same way as we've been doing um, previously, but the analysis can be elastic or nonlinear at serviceability. And at the ultimate limit state, you can choose all three types of analysis, elastic, nonlinear, or plastic. But the same as for concrete, you can only do plastic analysis for bridges or accidental situations. Um, in global analysis, we mentioned we have to consider shear lag. Um, there can be some benefit in actually allowing for shear lag, because the effects of shear lag are greatest at the supports, um, and less so in the span, which tends to mean that we shed moment from the, spat, from the um, supports into the span. And it's normally the supports, which is the hardest bit to design. That's the bit that's working hardest. So the, the beneficial shedding of load to the support, to the span, um, is beneficial. Uh, it clarifies certain things which we've just probably taken for granted in the past. Um, so, for example, it, it just explicitly points out that even if when you do your design of the steel member at the end, you design it plastically, the cross section you design plastically as a compact section, um, it says that it's still okay to do linear elastic global analysis, even though there's, in theory, there's an incompatibility there between your analysis and what you've actually then chosen to do with the cross-section. Um, and there are rules about mixing classes of section as well, which, which is very, very clear uh, in the Eurocode. So using old language in BS500, if we had compact sections and non-compact sections, i.e. I some bits which could be plastically designed, like mid-span, where the, where the slab is in compression. Um, and then at the support, we had a non-compact section, which we had to design elastically. There were concerns in the past about whether you could mix those two types of design within the same uh, structure. Uh, because if you have a plastic hinge forming at mid-span, then it sheds load to the supports. The supports are elastic and haven't got any reserve of strength, so is that OK? Uh, and the Eurocode basically says it's OK to, um, uh, it's, it's okay to mix, mix the classes. Um, if your, if your um, ratio of adjacent spans is uh, less than 0.6, then the only caveat is that when you're working out the plastic resistance of the span section, we should only use 90% of that in the analysis. And that's to allow some of this shedding from the span to the supports to give us a, a bit in hand. Um, otherwise, it's fine to, to mix them completely. Um, and the justification for that is that as long as the spans are not a you know, very short and a very long one together, the maximum load case for sagging at mid-span and the maximum load case for maximum bending at the supports will not be the same load case. So when, you, when you're considering the span, even if you shed some load in that load case to the supports, um, you're not actually considering the worst load case for the supports. It would be another one. When you get to very short adjacent spans, um, it's possible that the worst load case for the support might be exactly the same as the worst load case um, for mid-span. That's, and that's the reason why some, some caution creeps in. Even if, you, um, even if you don't satisfy that, and I'm not going to go through this, again, in the same sort of way, we could check things like rotation capacity in, in Eurocode 2 to check whether we can actually shed that component to, uh, from a hinge at mid-span to support. So we can do the same thing um, in, the, in Eurocode 3, but it generally won't be necessary because generally our supports, our spans are normally um, not less than sort of 0.6 of the adjacent span because we get uplift normally in that sort of situation. <clears throat> um, we can neglect various effects at the ultimate limit state, impose deformations um, without any sort of checks of rotation capacity. So if we, if we have um, what's called a class one section, which you'll see in a minute, which is basically just a very compact section, um, then it's just deemed that we've got enough ductility, rotation capacity to neglect differential temperature, differential shrinkage, and differential settlement. Um, it's also possible, if you're in that class, to neglect stage construction as well. So, um, you know, if you're building something up span by span, or, you, or, or you're, you're building up your stresses by putting your steel beam down, putting your slab down, if you've got class one sections throughout, you can just pretend the structure's just appeared and put all your loads on it. Uh, I don't think it, anyone will do that, though, because you could do that for the ultimate limit state, but then for serviceability, you'd have to go and build up your stresses again. So. If you took that approach, you'd have two global analyses to do. Whereas if you just build up the stresses, then there's only one analysis to do for serviceability and ultimate limit state. 
Um, there are various other things which we can um, neglect. Sorry, sorry, the other thing I should mention is that for pure steel, um, you have to be in class one, but if you've got a steel composite, as probably 90% of our steel designs are, then Eurocode 4 is a bit more lax and you can be in class one or class two and neglect all those effects. You must make sure you haven't got lateral torsion and buckling though. If you've got lateral torsion and buckling, you haven't got enough ductility. So you need to put enough bracing in to make sure we don't get lateral torsion and buckling. Uh, the various other things we can neglect as well. Um, I mean, the last bullet is just highlighting something else, but basically it's invented torsion in box girders, for example, can be neglected in the same way as it was in BS5400. If we can need to consider cracking, as we do, the Eurico gives us two methods that we can choose from. Um, the second method is basically the same as we have in BS500 Part 5, so we just um, choose crack section properties for 15% of the span either side of an internal support. That's what I would recommend we do. Um, the other alternative is a general method, which is just a really a time-wasting method. Um, and what you do there is you first of all do the analysis with an uncracked slab everywhere. You put your load case on. Um, you find where the slab would crack under that load case, and it defines would crack as um, the stress in the concrete exceeding twice the mean value of the axial tensile strength. Um, having determined where it cracks, you then modify your section properties in a second analysis um, to put in crack section properties. And if you do that, you normally find that probably on one side of the pier, you've got a, length of, a crack length of 0.14L or something, and the other one would be 0.16L. Um, and given the uncertainty in the strength of the t tensile strength of the concrete, it really isn't worth the uh, effort. So just, just do what we did before and use 15% either side of the span. Creep and shrinkage is, again, same as Eurico 2, treated the same way. So, again, we haven't got a nice, simple, long-term modulus, you know, just being sort of half the, the short-term modulus. We, again, have to work from the creep factor. So, N0 is what the Eurico 4 um, defines as the modular ratio for short-term loading, EA over ECM. Um, EA is the, uh, is, is the subscript used for structural steel. Um, when you see S, it's talking about steel as in reinforcements. Um, so basically Eurocode 2, I think, got it first and used S for a subscript for reinforcement and left Eurocode 3 with A. A basically um, stands for acier, the French word for steel, structural steel. So, so short-term modular EA over ECM. Long-term modulus we get from the short-term modulus by um, multiplying by a creep factor, which we get from Eurocode 2. And then there's an additional um, sort of calibration factor, Psi L. And Psi L has different values depending on the type of loading that you're, you're considering. So that the, the basically the three values that you have for permanent loads um, for the calculation of primary and secondary effects of shrinkage and for the effect of imposed deformations, that the three values of Psi L are bulleted there for you. Um, shrinkage, again, no simple uh, shrinkage strain. We haven't got a nice simple number, 200 micro strain to use. Again, we have to go to Eurocode 2 and calculate the shrinkage strain to use. Nonlinear analysis, as I mentioned before, is, is fully covered. Um, we're allowed to do it for SLS, ULS. Um, if we're trying to do nonlinear analysis of um, steel plate girders, which tends to be the only time we ever use it to try and justify something's existence if we've got the design wrong, or perhaps for assessment, um, then it's very well covered in Annex C of Eurocode 315. I don't, I don't propose to say anything more about that now, because it's not really very mainstream. Lastly, and we can have some coffee, um, classification of cross-sections. There are four uh, cross-section classifications in the Eurocodes. Basically, class one and class two are what we used to lump together as compact, but they've been separated out. <clears throat> and the reason they've been separated out is because plastic global analysis is allowed in the Eurocodes. So a class one cross-section is one where we can achieve a plastic bending resistance, but we've also got a lot of rotation capacity, so we can form a plastic hinge, which is adequate for a, a full plastic global analysis. A class two cross-section uh, is one where we have enough um, ductility to get a plastic cross-section resistance, but we haven't got that much rotation capacity. 
So we haven't got enough for a global, a full plastic global analysis. Class three and class four are therefore what we used to call non-compact. Uh, class three is, as you can see in the diagram there, a cross section where we can get up to first yield, perhaps a little bit beyond first yield, but we can't actually get up to the full plastic resistance before local buckling will set in. And a class four cross section is one which is so slender that we can't even get up to first yield. We'll get, we'll get local buckling at a lower load. Uh, Although we only had non-compact in BS500, we did effectively have a distinction between the same distinction here as class three and class four, but it wasn't flagged up. So if you were working out your section properties for a web and you found that you had to reduce the thickness of the web, basically what you had was a class four cross section. Uh, when we talk about class four cross sections next, um, we do something similar in the Eurocode, but we don't basically reduce thicknesses, we actually put little missing portions of, uh, of, of, of web or flange in to allow for the reduction in strength, but it's doing a very, very similar um, job. So if you want to classify the, the cross sections, uh, we come to the table in Eurocode 3 part 1.1, and there's a separate table for internal compression elements and outstand compression elements. If we want to prove that the section is or, or the individual components of a section of class 1 or class 2, then that's all about plastic behavior. And so when we work out the depths of plates and compression, we have to use plastic um, stress blocks. So we would derive a plastic stress block for the section. We'd work out the, if it was a web, we'd work out the depth of the web, the fraction of the web in compression alpha. And then we look at the expression for the allowable height over thickness of that web given that particular fraction of uh, web in compression. And we obviously use the same stress block to check whether it's class 1 or class 2. If we can't prove it's class 1 or class 2, then we obviously then move on to class 3. Class 3 is then all about elastic behavior, so we have to generate a, another stress diagram using elastic um, stress behavior. And if it's a composite built up in sections, then we really ought to build up the stress diagram following the actual build up of stresses. It's normally conservative not to do that. It's normally conservative just to look at the neutral axis and the composite, because uh, that normally means we actually have more, more of the web in compression. Um, but we need to really work out this, this elastic stress diagram, and then that gives us a fraction of, uh, again, basically a, uh, the, the measure of, of the depth of web in compression is the, the parameter psi, which is the stress ratio uh, across the cross-section. Uh, for different values of psi, we'll end up with different limiting heights to thickness again which we need to check. If we can't satisfy the limits for class 3, then by default we are class 4. And there's no more checking to be done as such. We get sent off to another code. We get sent off to Eurocode 3 part 1.5, and we have to work out our effective section properties um, for, for the class 4 section. Um, only other thing to point out, a very, a very subtle minor difference to BS5400 is, whereas in BS5400 the height over thickness um, was measured clear between the, for a plate good, it's measured clear between the flanges. Um, in the Eurocode, it's clear between the toes of the fillet welds. Uh, not usually very useful, because when you're doing the section classification, you haven't designed the welds at that point, so you can't take advantage of it. But if, if, you, were, if you were just missing a classification boundary, you might just say, oh, well, I'm bound to have at least six millimeter welds, and include sort of two lots of six millimeters deducted off the height of the, the web, for example. Um, outstands basically the same. We have to look at um, whether it's class 1, uh, 2, if it's not class 3, then again we are by default class 4. You, incidentally, you'll find these, um, the, the limits for class 2 um, for an internal plate basically correspond to the limit we had in BS500 part 3, because when part 3 was updated in 2000, it nicked the, uh, these limits out of the Eurocode at that time, so that you'll find they're compatible. But class 1 is more onerous than it was in BS500. Chris, what standard sections are you using? I mean, traditionally, uh, most of them were compact. Yeah. Um, what, what sort of brackets do they fall into as far as class 1 and class 2? Um, it's a good question. Well, things like universal columns, you mean? Uh, uh, yeah, UCs. Yeah. I, I I don't take this as gospel, but I think they're—I think they're all in the—I think they will all satisfy the um, class one 
generally, you know, where, where we were treating them as compact before they will fall into the class one category. Um, but UBs could be anything. <laughs> you know, they've got the full range. They could, could be compact to so the smaller ones, or they might be on compact, non compact. Um, having got the having got the classifications for each of the parts, it's the same as we did in BS five hundred. So the lowest, sorry, the highest uh, ranking for any part then dictates what the whole cross section um, has to be treated as. Um, the, the only exceptions to that, just mention them briefly, are it's allowable to if you, if you find you've got a class four cross section, there is an alternative approach where we can still treat it as a class three section. But we have to work to a lower stress than yield when we do the designs. We, we just we just substitute a, a a limiting stress for buckling in place of yield, and then just proceed the way we're doing with the class three section. We'll talk about that briefly in the next talk on class four sections, but I don't recommend that at all. Doing that, um, I don't recommend this other one either. Uh, it's possible to simply treat a class three section um, as an equivalent class two section by incorporating a little missing window in the in the web it's called the hole in the web method for obvious reasons um, it's not really suited to bridge design where we're building up cross sections and building up the deck um, progressively um, and the reason for that is you get into a lot of difficulty um, in trying to understand what to do with imposed deformations so if we have a, a class three section we don't have enough deformation capacity to neglect imposed deformations that's the rule, so we have to consider them. If we use the hole in the web method and we have basically a plastic cross section but a slightly reduced effective one, we can't actually consider some of those imposed deformations. Um, we can consider things like sort of settlement, but we can't consider things like differential shrinkage um, because they, 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 I mean, you can't include that in a plastic stress plot. So that there, there are some there are some difficulties in practical difficulties in applying that hole in the web method for um, for sort of bridges and it's probably more, more commonly used for buildings.